Um, linking to anything like that in Canvas really doesn't work. But in the handbook, there are some suggestions for podcasts. And the one I recommend you all listen to at the moment is called The Psychology of Video Games. It's by Jamie Madigan, who has written a couple of really important books, um, including Getting Gamers, which is on the required reading for the module, and it's a very easy read. I think you read it, right? I read it. You did? Yeah. What did you make of it? It was really interesting. I liked the, um, the stuff about the individuation. That was really interesting. Oh, and it fitted perfectly oh my what gosh, you were doing. So yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, I, you know, I'm glad Jessica backs me up on that one because it's quite digestible as well. It's easy to read. Yeah, it's a really good book. Uh, so it's his podcast. And he goes through a lot of the concepts about games and gaming in a really, really straightforward way. So I was actually listening to a couple on Saturday. It's a really, really handy thing to have. And they're about 40 minutes each, the episodes. They're not too brutal. Anyway, um, there's a bunch here of Let's Play channels, which I've just kind of picked ones I think will be useful for people to watch to give you ideas for doing the project. They're all really long is the problem, so duck in and out of them, and then a bunch of academic resources around it. And then the weeks, right, so we did one week one obviously last week, and I have put lecture recordings up, although if you do want to go back and beware, and I think this is still going to be a problem even with these lights on today, it, it looks weird with the camera, everything looks really dark. Um, I look like a shadow puppet. All the way through, which is a good look for me, and I'm, and I'm, I am down with it. But um, <laughs> week two, magic circles and limited logic. That's what we'll be looking at today. Week three, ideology of games. Now that could have fit in in some other places, but I'm taking a potluck guess that this might be the most useful thing for you to use for the first assignment, um, because it's not necessarily ideology that I'm interested in here. It's something called procedural rhetoric. Um, which are drawn out. And if you did Reese's module last year, you'd be familiar with some of the content of this, although I've massively expanded it for this year. Um, and then social constructionism of the gamer in week four, week five, states of play, flow, um, and interestingly, the podcast I was listening to on Friday, on Saturday morning when I was getting the bus over to the football was about flow as a psychological concept. It was really, really cool because it came up with something that I hadn't thought of previously. So I'm going to have to go back and re-listen to that and redo the slides before we do the lecture. Because there was an idea and it was like, shit, I have, I didn't think of that. That's amazing. <laughs> so, um, okay, we're going to, we're, I'm, I'm, sadly, I've just given away my credit for it. I didn't have to tell you that, right? And you could have thought I was really smart. <laughs> Fuck sick. Um, there will be a prize on offer for anyone who can say that dude's name. Okay, when we get there, if you listen to the Jamie Madigan podcast, you will be able to say it, because he says it. Until Saturday morning, I have no idea how to say it. <laughs> he was literally going to be in week five, that dude. Um, and then being in the game and immersion and presence. Now, from week eight onwards, the co module content becomes what I call thematic. So there's um, narratology, gender, violence, and video games as a business itself. And those four topics almost inevitably will be part of the critical essay you have to write about whatever game it is you choose to do. So there is two parts to the content of the module. These ones that come before, and helpfully of course, we have week six, which is assessment week. So it breaks, I wish it was week seven because it would have made it a bit more organic. These are the ones that I think should be the main focus for the first assignment that I've set you to do. So, and hence the ones that come afterwards are things you should focus on for the second one. So there is some underlying logic as to what I'm doing here. Does anyone have any questions about last week or what we're going to do today before we begin? No? Sweet. Okay. Weirdly, this is a lecture theme today that I've not taught in a very long time. One. <coughs> uh, the reason why I haven't taught it in a very long time is I've done video games lectures for what, six years, something like that. But 
This is a theme which doesn't appear in anything in a media degree in Swansea, or to my knowledge, has never been taught in Swansea either. That's bonkers, because this is really, really fundamental stuff as to media itself and how we engage with media. So I'm kind of like, we should be doing this in week one of MS100, and I kind of need to go back and redesign that to bring this in. Because ideas and theories of play and games are absolutely fundamental to how we actually interact with all media today. And I think by the end of today, what I want you to appreciate is Play has blown up to becoming one of the most fundamental ways that we engage with the world itself and what we do today. It's everywhere. Theoretically, there's real problems with how play works. So that's what we're going to get into today. And when you're doing your let's play, I will want you to focus a little on what game it is you're doing, what that means to play that game, but also that word play. What is play for you? What is, what is the experience of play here? How does play work? What are you doing at that point in time? So let's start with that. Tell me what you think play is. Chair doesn't work, does not it? It's a shame, I'm looking to steal an office chair to go home. Yeah. Why should I pay? Oh my, my heart is a flutter already. Getting good for these lights. <coughs> Cheat. That's well off one of the slides, that is. Well, yeah, you said to look at the slides. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> <laughs> word for word, that one. <laughs> Actually, from my notes, I must have just copied it word for word. Okay, does that, uh, carry on going if anyone's got anything to add to this. <coughs> I think there's a really interesting theme in most of these answers, which I'm kind of going to go after a little bit here and take on and try and get rid of it. Um, 
Morgan, you use the term another world. Jordan, different world situations. Josh, <coughs> mm, ah, I, I like it, I like it. Uh, play is a concept which can enter and immerse yourself a new space. So again, I want to point out here is everyone's kind of tacking the same kind of thing this year. So Dan, in an external environment, I think that works in the same kind of way um, to these. Jess, you've avoided it, which is interesting. Um, engaging with the world, I think that is thematically similar that with the idea that there is this world and then there is another world next to it. Play something to get you to interact with something. Uh, escapism, I think those and that would fit in with all those other ideas as well, that concept of escape from this into that. Um, detachment from reality, you put it in a really nice way, Nick, because it, again, it's the real versus the play world. Um, There's a little bit in there, Ben, about when you're talking about situation, but I think you roll back a little from what it is. Play is a concept. Yeah. <laughs> <It is. laughs> um, the reason why I am excited by these answers is, one, it shows that some people have done some reading. And two, it opens up a space for discussion here. Because this notion of the world is here, and play is here <coughs> has actually been very much problematized by video games. It's the classic notion of what play is. Theorists of play have always argued that play exists independent of everything else. You step over a boundary when you play. You exit that world and you enter this world. Now there are distinct reasons why that is and in a sense, it is a classical neoliberal explanation of the value of what play is. Play is not seen as something fundamentally economically valuable. So you've got the world here where business and commerce and all that good stuff and labour exists. And play is something outside of it. Play is something which we shift over here. It's not fundamental to our work ethic our achievements, etc. If you bracket it, you change its value. The argument that has developed in game studies, probably over the last 20 years, but in certainly over the last 10 years, is that that is fundamentally incorrect. The play actually is ingratiated in this one thing we have. Play and games are all part of the same world. So when we step away from what we're doing to be, and somebody's who said immersion. Where is it? Somebody said. Josh, you mentioned the, the, the word immersion, which is something we talk about in a few weeks' time as a concept as well. But fundamentally, that idea that we immerse ourselves in a world which is separate from the one that we're in is still a really attractive idea when we think about play as a concept. There's no question about that. And one of the driving reasons that a lot of us play video games is to do that. Right? The world sucks. Let's be fundamental about that. At this moment in time in particular, things are not good. How do we escape? Doing anything else. Like, like being that distracted by yeah. playing games, watching. What did I do on Friday night? I was tired. So, again, put Red Dead Redemption 2 on. I'm in the prologue. I finished the epilogue, in fact. I'm done. The whole game is finished. So I just ride about as John Marsden now, robbing houses. And you know, there's like little groups of people and they're all on their knees. It's like, please, sir, please. <laughs> and, uh, after a couple of hours, I just feel I just felt better about myself as a human being. To be, and there's a darkness underpinning that. But um, but it, for a couple of hours, you know, work blows and like, oh my god, interest rates are going through the roof. I'm gonna have to remortgage the house. And oh my god, this is sucks. 
and you forget. You take yourself out and do something different and you genuinely do forget. So that notion, which a lot of you have come up with here, I think is really, really important. And it's almost like a common sense way of understanding what play is. However, there is a more nuanced approach that we need to take, is what I'm going to argue. Not that um, that view we should get rid of it, because I think fundamentally and importantly psychologically, that is one of the reasons why many of us engage with digital games in the first place. That notion of escapism, the notion of embodying a different character, doing a different thing, and being able to experience something different in that way is fundamentally important to us. But at the same time, we need to recognise that play and games are also ingratiated into our lives in ways that the th classical theories of play don't allow us to actually think about. So, first up, always separate games and play out. They are not the same thing. Play is conceptual. It is, it is an idea. Games are a materialisation. Well, you know, some games are not played, for example, so they can be different in that way. Not all games are play, and not all play is actually game-based, and that in itself is really important. Games, by and large, have rules, outcomes. Not all play needs to be rule-based and outcome-based. You know, there is a fundamental difference to that. There are video games that challenge the notion of what a game is. Has anyone got any ideas about games which aren't rule-based or outcome-based? And they're, you know, they're sort of increasingly more popular since, I'd say, PlayStation 3, Xbox 360 generation of consoles. So they've been around a while now, if you think those consoles are about 2006, 2007. <coughs> So we're talking 15 years, where we've seen the emergence of games which actually challenge what the hell a game is, because there is no outcome necessarily. What are sandbox games? By and large, yeah, I have to think about that for a second, because a lot of sandbox games are rule-based as well. I'm actually writing something about Red Dead Redemption 2 on this. One of the key marketing points of that game is it's scope and the argument that it isn't a game based game you know you can go off and do anything i don't agree with that i think it's actually really closely aligned to a certain set of rules of what you have to do but and those rules are, are really really problematic when you pick them apart as well because it's a whole bunch of white savior colonialist sort of stuff going on in that game which is really problematic the idea of the sandbox is important but there are games within that genre which extract themselves from rule-based play altogether as well. Any ideas? I'm not even thinking of things which are necessarily that obscure. Morgan, what have you got? I'm thinking if, if a game that really kind of challenges the concept of direction and rules is probably Bioshock 1. I know why you're saying that. Yeah. I don't, I don't, <laughs> want, to, I don't want to spoil it for anybody, but... Well, don't worry, I've, there's yeah. a few bunch of spoilers coming for it in the lecture that the line, so I wouldn't worry about oh, it. Right. <laughs> it's because a friend of mine wrote the book about how about exactly what you're talking about, Robert Jackson, in 2013. Um, I'm going to disagree. Okay. Only because you've played Bioshock, right? Yeah, I've um, I replayed it when I was recovering from my operation last year, so about a year ago. Um, not as good as I remembered, for one, and two, very linear. When you play it again, you just notice... I already knew what the spoiler is yeah. at the end, right? But when I played it again, it's like, this is like, this is like a rail shooter. I, you can't really go off and do anything. Um, I, I'd even contest that it's a sandbox game. I don't, I'm not sure it is. Because although it's an expansive world, you are, le you are literally led through on a rope on that game. But I, but I, especially with the idea of rules, but it, there's a, something very subtle it does with rules, and it's kind of a meta-commentary on games itself. But, and we will talk about it. Mm. Don't worry. It's not quite what I'm thinking. 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, no Man's Sky. Yeah. Oh, is that the one with like the randomly generated planets? Mm. Oh yeah, yeah. A anyone played it? I, I actually haven't, uh, which is weird because it's available for VR as well, and I've just not got around to it. It's a thing. I look at it and think, I don't want to get into that. This because th this could be my life. You know, I I don't I don't want to be part of that. I don't have the time for it. So No Man's Sky. I mean, like that. Disclaimer, I've not played it, but I've read a lot about it, and it is fundamentally an interesting concept. But there's nobody here who's given it a go? No? Does anyone know much about it? I know, like, the story of how it failed and then it built, it built, built itself back up. And it's got a big cult following now, yeah. uh, a lot of engagement. It's ostensibly, I don't think open world is the right way of putting it. Because, as you said, Cheska, there's a randomly generated aspect to it. It's continually growing. Um, and ostensibly, it is a game that has no parameters. There's no real point to it. You, you can accumulate stuff, sure. You, know, you can accumulate in-game currency, you can accumulate items, you can customise your spacecraft and your dude and what have you. Or lady, depending on how you design your avatar. And that's it. You, you just go around doing whatever. Different worlds. I'll go here, I'll go there. There is no end point. There is no real point to anything you're doing. Pure escapism into a different environment. This is not classically what would be thought of as a game. There, there is really no purpose to what you're doing here you have to make your own purpose. You, so the rules of the game have to be ostensibly invented by the player rather than the game itself. And there are a, num there are a number of um, online games which play around with that kind of format as well and leave you in an open world where you make your own decisions. Back 15 years ago, there was the emergence of a virtual environment which was considered to be a game by some people called Second Life. Uh, to see a few people know then about Second Life. And Second Life was extremely interesting. And I think the idea of it being a game came from what it looked like. It, it had the aesthetic of a game. But it was to be just an open world where you could do anything. I used to go to philosophy lectures in Second Life. They were terrible, but I used to go anyway. And I used to get thrown out of them as well because I would point out how the people who were doing the lectures were wrong about fundamentally everything they were talking about as well. There was one on Descartes, which I was like, about 10 minutes in, I was like, have you actually read Descartes? Everything you've said so far has been completely wrong. <coughs> <sighs> Never mind. Um, I'm still kind of angry about that. Um, no rules. Or as the physical rules of the environment itself can't be violated, but you could do anything you like in Second Life. So there are some instances where games, what we might think of as games, aren't games at all. That you know they don't have the formal logic of what a game is. But these points usually hold. Play is conceptual, a game is an instantiation materialism or a materialization of what play is. Play sits, if you like, above the game. Play as a concept isn't the game itself, it is something that we project onto the game. Some game and it's really important to pull those apart because some games play much better than other games. And it's always an important point. Games we enjoy, the play mechanics are usually enjoyable to us. That does not go for every game by any means. If you want a good example of that, play any game that has tried to take on the Aliens film franchise. Everything ever made for that franchise has been, since the Mega Drive game Alien 3, which came out in like 1991, they have sucked beyond belief, because the play mechanics of those things have always been terrible. And that, that, uh, that, get, that, they should be like the best selling games of all time. The concept is amazing, and it's just, yeah, they suck. Conventionally speaking, theoretically, play has always been seen as separate from ordinary life. This goes 
historically across how play has been conceptualized. I've got to get the pronunciation right now. I never pronounce it. For somebody I have cited constantly <laughs> through my career, I have never been able to say this guy's name right. It's Johan Huizinga. <laughs> got there in the end. Huizinga, this concept is as old as the hills. Huizinga was writing about this in the 1930s, 1920s even. Play is contained in what he calls the magic circle. When we play, we enter this kind of immaterial bubble. Then you want to say, this is the magic circle. This is where a different set of rules and a different set of standards for behavior and a different set of outcomes apply. There's life, and we're in the magic circle of play. And this idea has been deeply, deeply attractive across the history of theorizing about play. I think it's getting less attractive, fortunately. But um, it kind of corresponds with what we've been saying earlier about play itself. When you were repeating these kind of phrases, that really evokes to me the idea of a magic circle of play. That play exists separately from everything else. So this concept stresses the play of any given game must occur within a spatially and temporally enclosed area, or what he called the playground. Interesting. Isn't it? And as such is detached from ordinary life, spatial and temporal. So it's different it's literally a different physical space. And that can resonate with games as well, with games that we play. And temporally, what he meant by that is that the this experience, the subjective experience of time can alter. And we've all had this, right? You're playing something and holy shit. <laughs> it's it's like what happened? <laughs> um, this happened to me in the summer with Stray, which isn't a very long game, but I turned around it was dark. <laughs> I was what? <laughs> and it was something like six hour game, but it's like that must mean I'm really close to finishing, man. Um, so, as he says, play is distinct from ordinary life, both as to locality and duration. Now, this has been the fundamental idea which has guided our theorization of play. So there he is. What I would say is, this is the classical um, observation. This idea of play being separate goes back to ancient Greece. You know, it, it's been around for a very, very long time. This is a very ideological way of thinking about play. It's got ideology ingrained into it here. The play is something which has a different set of values altogether compared to the rest of life and therefore is economically and socially not as valuable as the stuff we do at other times. It's, it's almost the perfect entry point to say play is a waste of time. That when you are playing you are wasting time rather than doing things which are somehow more valuable. And I don't know about you guys but that was my experience as a teenager. Yeah? I'd be upstairs, be playing the Mega Drive, and my father would come upstairs and my mother would be like, look at you wasting time doing that. And I was like, get the fuck out of my room. <laughs> <laughs> um, nothing changes over generations, by the way. Um, and look at how right they were. Look at me now. <laughs> I actually did a dedication to my parents in my virtual reality book. I said, if you hadn't let me waste all that time as a teenager, I never would have written this book. Which was kind of like, screw you bitches. <laughs> in a nice way, in a, in a very nice way. Um, my interpretation of this is that um, play here is um, protected from what is called the Protestant work ethic. The Protestant work ethic is really a notion that's rooted in the writings of Karl Marx, but also Friedrich Nietzsche, and going into the 20th century, it's the idea that the most valuable thing we can do is work hard, be serious, you know, have goals, you know, family, money, shit, houses, all that kind of stuff, you know. Play is not to do with that. And therefore is somehow of a different plane of value altogether to these important things in life. My argument really is games are not discreet in this way. 
that actually they are part of life, just like lots of other discrete activities as well. And they bleed into what we do. And we can see instances of how play and games actually are far more fundamentally part of life than Huizinga's original theory would have us believe. It's not quite that important. We will, I will be asking you about this soon, about games, but um, we do have a schism in game studies because of this. There are still a lot of game studies theorists who are really, really important, like Katie Salen and Eric Zimmerman, who I think are some of the, two of the most important games theorists out there and, and are really fantastic authors, and I, their book is amazing. Um, they still have versions of this idea of play, you know, and how play and games work. As a player steps in and out of the game, he or she is crossing a boundary or frame that defines the game in time and space. That, for me, is really a transposition of that original idea. It, I am far too down on the food chain to be criticising these guys. Right? They are, they're like, nyah, and I'm like, nyah. So, you know, so I, you know I, I'm loath to criticise these guys. I, I think that's a little bit wrong, though. <laughs> I, I do genuinely think they, they might be wrong. This is a sentiment markedly made by other scholars. So Calois, for instance, similarly proposes play as a separate, essentially a separate occupation, carefully isolated from the rest of life, and is generally engaged with in precise limits of time and place. Again, the temporal and the locational always become important. And it's that idea of separation again, which is really huge. So, for games here, Calvar says, there are four essential qualities of games, which actually mean that they become temporally and spatially separate from the rest of the world. We perform them voluntarily, so we make the choice to go into them. That, I don't think is actually true anymore. I think we are engaged in game mechanics a lot of the time, which we don't volunteer for. <coughs> which we are pushed into. They are uncertain, as in they don't have a definitive outcome until we start doing them. They are unproductive. Now that's a really problematic thing to say. But let's open it up. Is playing games always, really what he's saying here, pointless? Is it? I mean, to the older generation, maybe. How so? Because they didn't grow up with video games and, you know, they grew up with the traditional form of Define video. old, in that case. <laughs> uh, I mean, like, you know, like, um, like, my, like uh, not exactly my dad, but my mum, because, you know, she never grew up with video games. She always grew up with the traditional methods. How old's your mum? Uh, 45. Okay, so she's my age. Believe <laughs> 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 me, there was video games around yeah, when your like mum was a kid. Don't television. Worry. <laughs> yeah, okay. She doesn't understand the whole concept of games. Yeah, I don't think that's necessarily that unusual. Of course, no, no. that's not unusual for them. Is this uh, an experience that others have? Well, yeah, I've never played games, so I never. I know it does. Well, you it does blow me away that you're doing this module, quite frankly. Yeah, but. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> like, I've never been. Immersed in it, I've never. Not neither in the activity or the culture. Not at all. So it's not like it's. Look at us, like not... we're freaks, mate. <laughs> Strictly <coughs> generational. No, I don't know. I think that's. Aspect. I think that. I think there's some truth to that. That it isn't generational, you know. And I think, <clears throat> uh, in particular, gaming culture can be really problematic for those who aren't part of it. It can be very problematic for those who are in it, Jessica, as we know. But it can be really, really uh, problematic for those who are not part of gaming culture to look on those who are and think that that's impenetrable in some way. That there's a whole system there which is saying... But to go back to the idea of productivity, are there any positive outcomes from playing video games? Oh yeah, I mean, if you take it to like... Uh, like esports and things like that, it is a level of money behind this. Oh, I, hadn't, I, hadn't, I hadn't thought of that route, but so yeah. it can be in some shape or form a career for a lot of people. I don't agree with this, but this, that's what it is. I, I don't even think esports necessarily. No, if you are good um, YouTubers, twitching Twitch and YouTubers, right. yeah, yeah. But not only that, but even at the most basic level, it just provides happiness, doesn't it? And for a lot of people who would try and just like escape from their natural day to day life, yeah, give them happiness. 
I, I think that's a really, really fundamental point. The idea that you are being economically unproductive is something, but not all value is based on economics. Yes, yeah. um, well, we need to think in terms of like non-capital, you know, um, ways of accumulating, you know, good things. And if games bring us happiness, then sure. I mean, not all games make you happy, and not all games are meant to make you happy as well. Uh, you guys will play Tetris, right? Yes. I fucking hate that game. <laughs> uh, so, <laughs> yeah, you know, um, just give me the long thin one. Give me the long thin. I don't want the thing. I um. <clears throat> it's a thing that I used to say about really stupid people that they were the sort of people who would turn the square in Tetris. <laughs> um, Jessica, you were going to say something. I just I think that it is not not productive, but like like you said, like it can change your mood, and I feel like some like some old people might like be bored and go bird watching, and it makes them happy. But for me, like that. It completely changes my mood. It makes me. Bird watching is a euphemism. You know that, right? <laughs> Not. Uh, <laughs> that doesn't happen. Not really define productivity because, like, I think if it's something that makes you happy, then that is productive. And, you know. Absolutely. I mean, I'm, not, I'm obviously knocking against an open door here, but I think the idea that all you can produce is economic value is really, really problematic. Mm -hmm. um, and, and even given that, there, like you said, Ben, there is, there is, there are avenues for economic value in playing games anyway. Um, we could think of it even more prosaically than what we said about, like you know, streamers or esports. If you're engaged in playing something like online poker, that well, that's a game. That, uh, technically speaking, that's a video game. I would argue as well. You, you can win money. You know. You can also lose a lot of money as well. You've got to be careful with all that stuff. But it, you know, it, there are fundamental ways in which I think these things can be productive. You know, and we do have a lot of people employed in the video game industry, not just in development. You know, has anyone ever tried to be a tester? I was asked to do it. And, but you didn't? No. How come? Because uh, I think this was during a time where I was kind of conflicted between doing computer science or just doing media studies. I just didn't know what to do. Of course, it was media studies. So the, the dilemma stopped you from making money <coughs> playing video games? Essentially, yeah. That sucks, man. Because <laughs> I mean, testers don't get paid a huge amount of money. But I think it was a free job as well. Oh, yeah, okay. So they just wanted free labour. All right, there's, there's, there's something different with that. Test is a really important part of the video games industry, and you are ostensibly just paid to play games. Um, you can apply for these jobs. They are looking for testers at the moment for GTA 6, for example. I would love to do that. But it's incompatible with the other things that are going on in my life, unfortunately, but I was like, yeah, I could be paid to do this. I'm, I had a friend who was a tester. Um, He's the same age as me. He's 42. And um, he has done... He's never going to watch this. He has done nothing much really with his life, but he has a way cooler job than I do. <laughs> you know, so I can't really argue that. Um, consists of make-believe. The other rule that Calva says. That fundamentally, I think these rules are wrong. <laughs> Okay, there's something really problematic. But I'm again trying to draw out here how the theory of play and games itself is really problematic. That what is being proposed here is open for us to really mess around with and challenge in ways that a lot of theory in media studies is much more difficult to do. This kind of theory has real holes in it. And he gives four categories of games, competition, chance, imitation, and pleasure. Uh, those categories of games, I think, are more useful to us because, um, you know, they're competitive games. There are games where you don't have control. There are games where you mimic some part of the world. And I think in digital games, that is a very important thing to note that, you know, a lot of what we do is mimicry. And there are games which exist in order to give us pleasure. And Interestingly, I don't think that last one is compatible with his rules, but at the same time, it's, it's cool that somebody actually noted that. 
Just to finish up on play, Gregory Bateson, who was a, um, a polymath, an anthropologist who dipped his toes in a lot of different fields, he conceptualised play itself as a form of communication. That when we engage in play, we're engaging with communicating in a way that is different to that which occurs normally. Um, the manner, therefore, of play and what play enacts us to do becomes really important. And Mead, who worked with Bates in the lot, described play as a series of role-playing sort of exercises. Conditioning to do things. Who do you think they were looking at when they came up with these theories? Children. Yeah, very young children in particular. This idea of play as a form of training for life is deeply embedded in the primary education system. That you play and you put play activities in place which have some kind of functional outcome for the development and socialisation of kids. This is a more stringent idea of play itself. I, I think it's, it's probably right in terms of how play is conceptualised in education. The underpinning idea of that is what's called the hidden curriculum. Has anyone ever heard of that phrase? Yeah. What do you know about it, Jess? Just that, well, I don't really know a lot other than it's kind of what you learn as a byproduct of what you're learning, almost. That's a really, really good way of putting it. So the hidden curriculum, it's a sociological idea, and it's a critique of education. You learn all this stuff, but by doing so, you learn a bunch of other stuff the same time, like turning up on time, like sitting, but genuinely like, you know, sitting and listening to some twat talk for two hours. That is something that you are conditioned to do through the education system. What does this, what is the product of this? Well, it makes you into a nice little unproblematic worker bee when you finish your education. You can go into a boring ass office and sit there for eight hours doing shit on a computer because you have been conditioned to do that over the 15 years of your formal education. This notion of play as a form of communication is an extension of that, that play conditions us in particular ways. This is something I will pick up on in a big way next week, because there is a fundamental argument that a lot of the games that we play <coughs> not necessarily condition us behaviourally to do things, but condition us in terms of our ideological framework as, as people. The, the, when we play particular games, we start to accept the ideological positions put forward in those games because they're dressed up in a nice, like, neat little package where we don't think of them as ideology anyway. And therefore, we are, if you like, mentally conditioned by games to accept certain ways of thinking about the world. So, This is more akin to my theoretical thinking. Thomas Malaby, play does not describe a distinct human activity, so he wants to go the other way. He doesn't want to describe play as something that happens here. But a mode of experience, a way of engaging with the world. So helpfully, Eve robbed this the slide. <laughs> this notion of uh, an effective atmosphere, a lived experience, perceptual awareness, and emotional attunements that we determine how and what we know about place comes from the way we play. Play makes and characterises this atmosphere. This is far more akin to my thinking on what play is. Not something separate, but something that we do, and some, a way in which we engage with others and the world itself. It's a game. Where have, we, are, we are playing a, a certain set of games. It is the only way to stay rational and not go insane when you work in a place like this. To know that everything that goes on here is a game. Because if you took it seriously, you wouldn't come to work. <laughs> I'm not kidding. It's, uh, so this is, if you like, the stage and post I want to go to. That I don't necessarily believe in the separatism of games and play. I think games and play are all around us and create an atmosphere in the world which allows us to engage with the world in particular ways. And we do this all the time. Um, if we separate games out, 
we miss how this influences what we do and how we do it on a daily basis. So just to close this off for now, recap, just tell me what you think a game is now. Not play, but what is a game? Now? And then we shall have a break and then we will plough through the rest. It should be a whole bunch of fun. watching the worst parking job I've ever seen in my life. This is bonkers. <laughs> that, is, that is our game, yeah, that's true, yeah. <laughs> it's an old game. <laughs> that is a really literal answer to that question. What is a game? This one. I could have said like Pac-Man or something. Well, that's a game. I could have said anything. Yeah. <laughs> There's lots of games. <laughs> Maybe think a bit more on a theoretical plane. It's got to be more specific with these things. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's quite good. I like that. I like the one word in particular. I really like that. Because you're taking on board the baits and bit. Medium. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I've got, to, I've got to leave at this point. This guy has parked block three cars in, but there's literally two spaces. I don't, I don't understand what's going on here. This is really freaking me out. I want to go out there and... Open the window. There is like two spaces there. I can't park. Now I can. That's a mess. <laughs> the last time you did something you played until 4.44 a.m.? Um, the other last week I came back from a night out and I thought, right, I'm going to crack out some siege. And then before I knew it, it was quarter to five. But I started lecture like, the next day? Uh, no, 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 I think actually it was um, last Monday. So it would have been my day off Tuesday, but after your lecture. I'm glad I'm doing good work. <laughs> <laughs> Brings it out of nowhere. I mean, Cheska's just parroted uh, Morgan's basically, but. I didn't even read it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. I swear <laughs> not. Not only are you sitting next to him, but you I can see it in front of you. You're both right. <laughs> it's really yeah, important to make a from this, alright? I don't even know which one's yours. Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah, well, that's just a. That's not a lot of that, is it? And I'd expect nothing less from you, like that. But. <laughs> so, there's a few answers here which. A lot of people actually have come up with a similar kind of thing here, which I think is really important. That notion of a game is a medium by which play can be exhibited, can be enacted in particular ways. That notion of it being a medium is really important. I will invoke, inevitably, right, I'm going to invoke uh, McClear one later. And I think that notion of games as the medium by which play can occur 
is a very important way of thinking about it. As McLuhan teaches us, mediums are everywhere, which is why I think that notion of players and atmosphere is really important because it means that we, there are mediums for play all around us rather than just the things that we might think of as games. And we will have a think about how that affects. And I will break for five now, right? But as you do that, have a think about how, what games you play which aren't games, if that makes sense. Is there anything about, think about university in particular. How does it make you play a game? Five minutes. <coughs> go do, go do. Yeah. I'm obsessed with that. It is. Running around. Do you know when you work again, Mike? You know, when you have about the communications, how you take on different communities in the two roles. So, yeah, immediately for one of the two lobbies. Yeah, I love how it works. That inspires the worst size of people. Well, there's lots, right? Of games which inspire us to. Communicate in ways which are not out. Basically, yeah. <laughs> I think that's the best way of putting it. I think when it came to like role playing, that's not it. I was thinking you know, uh, like PC games like Squad, where like we need to. I know what you mean, yeah. Wait, it, 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 it loses that whole like game feel like, and some of it's one of like, the closest like simulations to a completely different. Yeah, yeah. and all the time because of the way you. Go about it's doing it. It doesn't feel like the movie does feel like your. Yeah, I, I think that's yeah, fair. <laughs> and um, they're not games that I play very often, and not for, there's, there's certainly no, not for wait, years now. No and the reason being is I'm I'm not keen on that. Yeah. That that sort of embodiment of a different set of values altogether. Changes, yeah. Really does freak me out a bit. Yeah, so it's it's not great. Like, it. Oh well, it, it, well, it can be. I think I, I, there's nothing intrinsically wrong with this. It's just uh, it's not my cup of tea, like you know. For me. Yeah, I did book it. I seen somebody booked in. Me. Is he over there? Yeah. More or less. I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> Me too. I can't wait. It's, it's, it's the highlight of my day already. It's not my diary. I was in the middle of writing my diary. We start the lectures and close this out. <coughs> Listen to Nick. I know who he's talking about. <laughs> <laughs> I had to think about that when I finished it and I kind of wanted to explore the outside yeah, of it. Like, but like I but I also at the same time because of what happens just before you get out. And I was quite happy that it did finish that. Yeah, I think it was cute. I liked it. It was like love how like should problem solve but now I'm playing um, again. Arkham Knight, so I never, yeah. I never, I love the I first one. I haven't done that, I've just yeah. bought, awesome. you know, the, um, yeah. it's on the PSN Premium, and yeah, yeah. Um, yeah but I haven't installed it yet. Yeah, it's yeah. good so far, it sounds gorgeous, it's really good. It's much more heavily focused on like the Batmobile, which I don't, okay. I don't super enjoy driving games, I'm like, oh, but, it, but it's good, so. I, I mean, so people are trying to get me to do Cyberpunk 27-7 mm. again. Yeah. And I had a go with it a few months ago, and 
it was just boring. It's still glitching as well. It's still it's, it's not, I don't think it's quite finished. Um, I just thought it was really dull. Um, and then there's, there's these people I'm working with, and Steph, who's running this project, she's like, oh yeah, it's amazing, it's amazing, you've got to play it, you've got to play it, I can't believe you're not playing it, why aren't you playing it now? And I said, I don't fucking be bothered. I really don't know. I, I would much... I, I have a birthday coming up and my sister asked me what she want for your birthday. Which is this ridiculous dance that the two of us go through, right? Because we just go on Amazon and just buy some random stuff for each other. But I actually asked her, can you buy me Far Cry 6? Because that's a game I can deal with. But Far Cry 5 was so weird. It's the ending of it was so bleak. I kind of liked it. Does anyone know how, how it ends? Yeah, yeah. It was. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, th I kind of thought that was cool. So it doesn't matter what you do at the end, everyone's going to die anyway. Yeah, it's which is kind of cool. Like, it's a bit of a left turn from the rest of the story. I, I like the idea of this going to be more combat. Yeah, I did. I did combat. When I when I got that, because I didn't actually know what the end it was. I studiously like not looked, and uh, but I knew it was controversial. And when I when it happened, I was like. I've just put like 35 hours into this game and you have just ripped me off completely. It was because it essentially says everything you've done is pointless, right? Yeah. Um, but then you're like, ah, no, it wasn't that pointless. You know, I, I, I blew up some cool stuff and killed some Nazis. Mm -hmm. That's all I need in life, really. Killing Nazis is all I need. <laughs> yeah. I'm waiting for another Wolfenstein to do that. That was a great example of uh, discourses in video games. The last Wolfenstein game, which was protagonists were two females. Uh, predictably, everyone was like, "This is the worst Wolfenstein game ever. This is this one sucks. This is terrible." The, the two main characters are so annoying. And this is you're talking about a, like a game series where like the main protagonist in the past has been a semi superhuman Czech freedom fighter who has the vocabulary of a three year old. You know. Where do you get off? <laughs> you ready? Cool. Okay, so, for me, games always require these things, and this is something that you could build into your Let's Play, definitely. You require time, rules, the effect mood, the effect behaviour, and effect, importantly, the outside world as well. When we play, we don't just park it there. We bring things with us, always. What we do is not intrinsically locked away in some kind of special store, but we take our knowledge that we have from our engagement with games and we integrate it into our everyday existence as well. A lot of people, you know, fundamental history lessons are learned from playing video games, weirdly, which is kind of interesting.